The Texaco Star Theater. More than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast welcome you to an hour of mirth and melody. With our star comedian, Fred Allen. Kenny Baker in Portland Hopper. The Texaco Roundtable. Wynn Murray and Al Goodman's Orchestra. It's Texaco time. Ladies and gentlemen, once again it is my pleasure yeah, hurry up, to introduce that happy oh, harlequin, let's go, let's go, that Jimmy. tycoon of titillation, Step on it, that magnificent Jimmy. berry maker. Come on, Jimmy, that's plenty. All right, here he is, Fred Allen in person. I, <laughs> I took a big bow. I bought some new suspenders. I wanted to try them. <laughs> And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Say, Fred, what's the rush? I had a swell introduction well, we, all... We, we can't waste any time tonight, Jimmy. We've got to get the program started before they change the wavelength on us again. We've got to... <laughs> What wavelength? Well, don't you know that last Saturday, 802 radio stations in this country changed their wavelength? Oh, no, I didn't know. Well, I, a lot of people didn't know. Radio has been a composite mess, Jimmy. Wavelengths today are all mixed up. Why, the other night, uh, Mr. Fadiman asked uh, that other man, Mr. Oscar Levan, a question on information, please. <laughs> he, uh, you ought to start yourself, I mean, because... <laughs> A little, a little starch in your bath water, and you won't wobble so much up here at the microphone. But wavelengths are all mixed up. Mr. Fadiman asked Oscar Levant a question on information, please, and a hillbilly band on Major Bo's program answered that question. Why, one lady I know tuned in and got John Barrymore sitting in with the quiz kids. No kidding. Why, just before we went on the air tonight, a man rushed into the studio here yelling, I'm the father of 19 children, unquote... Who was it? It was one man's family. They thought they were this program. So you see, Jimmy, we can't waste any more time. We have got to let people know that this is the Texaco Star Theater. Well, how can we, Fred? All we have to do is turn to the latest news of the week. The Texaco News presents its highlight from the world of news. Chicago, Illinois. Judge Joseph Sabbath, who has spent three decades listening to divorce cases in the big cities of the world, singles out principal causes of marital strife. Judge Sabbath claims the chief causes of present-day divorce are... Working wives. Non-working husbands. In can meal. Interfering in-laws. Tonight, Texaco News checks on Judge Sabbath's theory and invites a select group of marital malcontents to its microphone to check on outstanding causes of wedlock instability. Now, our first uh, participant, a member of the Alimony Club for some months, is Mr. Pumphrey Lynn. What, uh... What caused, what caused your divorce, Pumphrey? Uh, well, the little woman and me was occupationally maladjusted. Uh, well, how, how do you mean? I worked nights and she worked days. We never seen each other. Oh, you, uh, you work nights, you say? Yeah, I'm a night watchman. I finish work at the break of day. Well, what about your wife? Well, the little woman was head stopper for the Western Union. Head stopper? Yeah, she puts the stops in day letters. Oh. Uh, you know, dear Joe, stop. Arrive, say stop. Oh, I Coming see, home, yes. Stop. Don't, uh, don't overdo it. I yeah. got it. The first. <laughs> and uh, these day letters, you say, kept your wife busy all day. Yeah, for ten years, me and the little woman never seen each other. And you were happily married all this time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
every morning, every morning, she'd leave my breakfast and a love note in the sugar bowl. A, uh, a Billy Do in the sugar bowl. Huh? Yeah. There was always some baby talk. Like, roses is red, violets is blue, sugar is sweet. Whose baby is you? Oh, how ucky-ducky. Yeah, yeah. Every night when I went to work, I'd leave dinner all ready for her. And you'd leave a note for your wife? Yeah, I'd write, fish is in the oven. I got your fin and patty. The shite is in the icebox. Love and kisses. Daddy. <laughs> And this went on for ten years. Oh, yeah, till that fatal morning. And what happened? I come home, there's no breakfast, just a note. What did it say? Roses is red, violets is blue, met full of brush men, eloped today. Woo! <laughs> well, uh, tell me, uh, Pumpet, uh, have you heard, uh, have you heard from your, have you heard from your wife, Sin? Oh, yeah. She married the full of brush, ma'am. She did, huh? Yeah, uh, she sent me a card from Mexico with one of the guy's samples. And your marriage was broken up due to occupational maladjustment. Yeah, he got my wife. And you got the sample. I got the brush. <laughs> and to thank you again, as we thank you, Comfort Lynn. Another, another husband who came to grief is Hawthorne Prone. What caused your trouble, Hawthorne? A cracker box apartment. You mean the apartment was small? It was one room. The bed folded into the wall. When you pulled down the bed, the furniture sunk down into the floor. In this one room? Well, what about bathing? Oh, the bathtub was in four pieces. You could put it together as required. Oh, fine. Yeah, if you wanted a sink, you put two pieces of the bathtub together, catty corner, and somebody held it. Well, that was the... Well, how did you get your water? Oh, a hose hung outside the window. When you wanted water, you pulled in the hose. Only not when the bed was down. No, well, no, that, that, that made it too crowded, naturally. Yeah. yeah, it was the same with reading. You can only do it at certain times. Could you read in bed? How? When a bed comes down, the light bulb went up into the ceiling. Well, were you bothered uh, by mice? Mice used to come to the door and look in. There was no room, naturally, for them. They... Innocent bystanders, as it were. Well, how did you uh, how did you and your wife get along in a small apartment? Well, we was hemmed in, but happy. Good. Then come the blow. What brought that on? The wife's family got dispossessed. The whole tribe moved in on I and the wife. And you're all living in that one room? Yeah, it's murder. The grandmother is sleeping in the hall. The mother having nightmares on a fire escape. There's the father standing in the corner snoring. Three kids hanging up in snoods on the back of the door. Why, that's terrible. Why, uh, why don't you put your foot down? There's no room. <laughs> I can't even get my leg up. And your advice to newlywed husbands is... If you want to be bush in your own home, don't never move in an old cracker box apartment. Good. Live in a place where at least you got room to put your foot down. Well, thank you, Hawthorne. Thank <laughs> A, a, a gentleman who comes to us direct from a run of 27 weeks on the Goodwill Court. What, uh, what is your name again, brother? Lionel Standen. <laughs> Lion, Lion L? Yeah, Lion like in front of the public library, L like what ain't on 6th Avenue no more. <laughs> oh, Lion L. Stander, Lionel Standen. Lionel Standen. I finally got it. You want to run over it again? No. <laughs> no, no thanks. I think I've got it all right now. The way we was going, I thought one of us was subnormal. No. No bragging, please. <laughs> now, uh, what about your marital experience, Lionel? Well, it was a case of mutual frustration. Mutual frustration? Yeah. Well, what sort of a girl did you marry? She was a school teacher. It gave her a complex. It did? You mean that after you were married, your wife still acted like a school teacher? Yeah, every night when I come home from work, I had to bring her an apple. <laughs> One night I come home with elderberry wine in me, Brett. What did she do? She made me stay in and write Lionel as elderberry wine as Brett 200 times. Well, is that what split you up? That and gastronomic persecution. Yeah. Uh, that's what, uh, why you got a divorce. Yeah, my grounds was nocturnal vitamin incompatibility. Nocturnal vitamin incompatibility? The wife kept eating in bed nights. I couldn't get no sleep. 
Well, I don't see how. Well, we lived on a first floor in the apartment house. Yeah. At night, we'd leave the window open. The window up, I see. My wife would start eating sardines in bed. Sardines? Yeah, she liked herring, but she had a small mouth. <laughs> And you say she ate these sardines in bed? Yeah. When she put out the light, the cats in the neighborhood would smell the sardines and start jumping in through the window. Don't say. Some night there'd be 200 cats steeple chasing over their bed. And uh, you'd still be sleeping? But not for long. What would happen? Well, from having seepage in me muffler all winter, I got chronic asthma. This seepage in your muffler brought on this chronic asthma, huh? I'd whistle in me sleep. You'd whistle? Yeah, it wasn't bad enough with the cat. When I whistled, every dog on the block came jumping in. And when the cats and dogs got together... That's all, brother. You, uh... <laughs> you went to court? I got a divorce in hydrophobia. And, uh... And your advice to fellows contemplating marriage is... Men, marriage is a mirage. When you get up close, there's nothing to it. Well, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Baker brings our anti-marital fiesta to an arbitrary close by singing a love song, The Night We Met in Honamoo. gentlemen we had left over on last week's roundup of spring poets, that little known versifier, a man about Rondelay, Mr. Orestes Flicker. What was the title of the poem you missed out on last week, Orestes? Somebody Tell Me. Somebody Tell Me. You're going to recite it tonight. Somebody Tell Me by Orestes Flicker. Go right ahead, Orestes. I'm an expert on quizzes. I often win prizes. 
because I am smarter than most other guys is, why Franklin B. Adams calls me on the phone when stuck with a sticker he can't swing alone. But one question stumps me. I flop with a thud when anyone asks me just what is a dud. Well, thank you very yes, much. Yes, what is a dud? Will someone explain what is a dud? Is it fancy or plain? What is a dud? Well, Does it swim in the sea? What is a dud? Is it you? Is it me? Now, just what? A what? I what? Think, well, what? Well, what? Wait a minute. You'll have every horse in the neighborhood stand. Wait a minute, Oresti. If you if you give Jimmy Wallington, if you'll give Jimmy Wallington a chance to get a word in edgewise here, he'll be glad to explain in detail. Jimmy, just what is a dud? Why, the flat, dull sound of the word dud itself tells you what it means. Something worthless, useless, dud, D-U-D. And gasoline duds are the sluggish, slow-action elements in gasoline. The ones that fail to take the spark, waste fuel, steal power from under your very foot. When you pay for full power, you want it. And you get it with Fire Chief Gasoline, for the duds are out. Removed by important steps in technical refining. In Fire Chief, you're getting only the volatile, fast-action elements that deliver lively starts, smooth acceleration, and long mileage. Next time, try a Texaco dealer and start using famous Fire Chief gasoline. Remember, you'll be buying all action, not a dud in a tank full. Played by Al Goodman and his Parry Mutual Pipers. And now, and now, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Goodman. Yes, Mr. Allen. Uh, what is that thing you uh, were uh, uh, waving at the orchestra? I mean, you've been using all night. That thing you're waving at the orchestra. Oh, this. This is my new baton. It's termite proof. Well, why a termite proof baton? Why he is asking? Yes. Right. With a wooden baton, termites are making a snack bar. This baton is metal, and termite biting this is bending the bridge work. Well, you have got something there, maestro, and it isn't a termite-proof baton. No? This thing is nothing but an ordinary umbrella rib. But Kenny Baker is selling it to me for a baton. Mr. Goodman, yesterday was April Fool's Day. Kenny gave you the Cornish hug, as the saying goes. You were a fall guy. Goodman, a fall guy, and in spring yet. Good. <laughs> Goodman is an all-out fall guy in any season. Oh, hello, Portland. Hello, I Mr. Dallas. Yeah. Oh, now, wait a minute, Portland. Stop. What, what are you doing? Stop walking around in circles. Well, I'm looking for gold. What gold? You won't see any gold in here unless Mr. Goodman yawns again. <laughs> unless the dentist took that bridge back. I don't know. 
Now, look, let's but get... But there may be gold here. This divining rod can tell. That thing you are holding is a divining rod? This is another termite-proof baton. Quiet, please, maestro. Portland, what you have there is an umbrella rib. <laughs> and Kenny Baker sold it to you yesterday, am I right? Yes, but... Yesterday was April Fool's Day, Portland... Kenny played a little joke on you and the maestro. You see, well, there's no harm done. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, clean, innocent fun. But I paid Kenny three dollars for this rusty old umbrella rib. Foxy Goodman only paid two. You should have dickered. <laughs> You should both learn to suspect everybody on April Fool's Day. I certainly don't blame Kenny for duping you. Hi, folks. Anybody want to buy some fishing rods for guppy fishing? <laughs> the guppy fishing? Put away those umbrella ribs, Kenny. April Fool's Day is over. Oh, you're half, huh, Yes, eh? I am half, Kenny. Some April fooling, I'll say, when you sold Mr. Goodman an umbrella rib for a, <laughs> for a termite-proof baton. Oh, chiller, huh? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you stuck Portland with another rib for a divining rod? <laughs> well, wait till the night. If it rains, you're really going to see a gang. <laughs> <laughs> you slay me, Kenny. What's going to happen tonight if it rains? Well, those umbrella ribs. Yeah? I took them out of your umbrella. <laughs> Now, just a minute, Kenny Baker. Fun is fun, but tearing ribs out of people's umbrellas isn't funny. But, F.A., Kenny, it was a... Kenny, you take those umbrella ribs, that divining rod and that baton there, you take them all, get them together, and put them right back in my umbrella. Okay, okay. How do you like that, kid? A part-time vandal yet. <laughs> Destroying public property. Oh, be a sport, Mr. Ballard. Now the hole is in the other stocking. He who is laughing... <laughs> he who is laughing last is Goodman. Ha, <laughs> ha. Better you should know when to wait. He who is laughing should know when to wait for a laugh. I mean, that would be the thing. <laughs> well, quiet to both of you. I'm here to tell the two of you, now that you're here, that that boy needs a lesson. Kenny Baker, I'll show him what it feels like to be make a, made a fool of. What are you going to do, Mr. Allen? I am going to make Kenny look sillier than the end girl in a daisy chain. <laughs> That's possible. I'm going to have a go at it. Sound man. Yeah, Mr. Allen. Now, look, Sam. You're not, uh, you're not doing anything. When Kenny Baker comes back, I want you to go outside and call him on the telephone here in the studio. Yes, sir. Tell him that you are the Pot of Gold program and that he has just won a thousand dollars. You understand? Yeah, Mr. Allen. I'm the phone baker and tell him he won the Pot of Gold. Right. Now hurry up. Gosh, isn't that going to be a dirty trick on Kenny, Mr. Allen? After all, he's one of the gang. One of the gang. I'll show you just how loyal that little scamp is. Now, quiet. He's coming back. Mr. Allen. Yes, Kenny? Your umbrella's okay now. Well, all right then, Kenny. We'll just let bygones be bygones. April Fool's Day is over. Let's have no more practical jokes. All I dare you no malice, lad. He should live so long. <laughs> Maestro, please. Now, say, Kenny, it just occurred to me, while you were out... An interesting community problem ha ha came up. What problem? Well, uh, now, as you know, we all use the telephone here, yeah. and uh, we all chip in every month and pay the phone bill. Am I right? Yes, F.A. Well, now, suppose this phone number here won a prize. What prize? Well, uh, just let's say the, the pot of gold happened to call this number. Now, if we won, we should divide up the money evenly, don't you think? Why, Mr. Allen. Why, at Portland. Well, Kenny, what do you think? Since we all pay the phone bill, if the pot of gold calls, we should all share and share alike. That's the spirit, Kenny. Well, I wonder who that is ringing. Will you uh, answer it, Kenny? Oh, my feet hurt. You answer it, Porty. All right. You stay where you are, Portland. Why don't you answer it, Kenny? Why don't you answer it, Mr. Allen? You get all the answers on the program. Uh <laughs> No sarcasm, maestro. Always making an issue of everything. Now, answer the phone, Kenny. You're the youngest. Oh, all right. Hello? What? What? Who won what? I won... Uh, uh, yes, this is the number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, just send it up to my house. Well, uh... Well? Well, I guess I'll run across the street for a cherry Coke until my next number. So long, Kenny. wait a minute. Wait a minute, Kenny. Who was that on the phone? Oh, nobody, uh, uh, by the way, F.A., I was thinking, uh, 
Well, since I do most of the phoning around here, I ought to pay the whole phone bill. That'll make it my phone, won't it? Why, yes, it will, Kenny. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, if everybody uh, calls the number from a contest or something, it, why, that would mean me. Yes, it would mean you. And incidentally, the cost of the phone, the phone bill, is $5. Okay, here you are, Mr. Allen. Thank you, all right. Well, I guess I'll be running along now. <laughs> no, you don't, you baby face. <laughs> You're not rooking us, shopper. Rooking? I don't know what you mean, F.A. Oh, quit kidding, Junior. We know you won something on the phone. We heard you. Oh, it's too late now. We made a deal. Kenny, I'm ashamed of you. In humanity and also Kenny. I, Goodman, I'm losing faith. <laughs> All right. Suppose I did win something. You haven't won anything, Kenny. That phone call you just answered was a phony. But gosh, the man said on the phone... I know what the man said. The man said you won the pot of gold. Now, I'll show you exactly what happened. Sound, man. Yeah, Mr. Allen. Uh, Sam, explain to Mr. Baker here about that practical joke we arranged. You know, about the phone call. Oh, I haven't made that call yet, Mr. Allen. The line was busy. <laughs> you didn't make the call. You didn't make the... You didn't make... I didn't make the call. But why is everybody looking at me? I didn't do nothing. The line was busy, so help me. I tried, but the line was busy. Everybody's looking at me. Stop crying. But, Mr. Allen, that phone call. I know, quiet. It was the real thing. Don't explain it, quiet. What's everybody so excited about? Who's excited? You are. You're... Nobody, nobody's excited, Kenneth boy. Now look, Kenny, old man. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'll do. You have learned your lesson, son. Why should it cost you money? I, I'll tell you, I, I, I've got to do this. I'll pay the phone bill. Let the phone be in my name. Who cares? Here's your five dollars back. Oh, gee, F.A. And here's another five dollars for being such a good sport. Oh, you're a prince, F.A. And now that it's my phone, it might interest you to know... That phone call you just got from the pot of gold was supposed to be a phony, but through some strange coincidence that could only happen in radio, <laughs> it turned out to be the real thing. But, Mr. Allen... Now, uh-uh-uh, Kenny, it's too late. It's my phone and my thousand dollars. Not that the money means anything. <laughs> I'll probably throw it away in some bingo den tonight. <laughs> But you have learned a lesson. That is the main thing. And as a byproduct of your education, I seem to have won the pot of gold. But, F.A., that wasn't the pot of gold. What? Well, I, I heard you say you won. It was a radio telephone contest, wasn't it? Yes. It was some aluminum company program. They called and said this number won. Well, it's just like the pot of gold, isn't it? Yes. Only they call it the pot of pots program. They just give you the pot. Well, I... We're right back to where we started. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have you... Uh, I would like to have you meet a young lady uh, who was with us all last season, and tonight is right back where she started, Miss Wynne Murray. Thank you. Well, Winnie, it's nice to have you back on the program again. Thank you, Mr. Allen. When I knew that you were going to join us tonight, I said to myself, the minute Wynne Murray comes to the microphone, I am going to ask her a question. Well, now you're here, and I have my question ready. Will you answer truthfully? That all depends, Mr. Allen. What is your question? What are you going to sing? With a twist of the wrist. That's all I wanted to know. Maestro? <laughs> With a twist of the wrist, with your lips that insist, with that comes with a look in your eye. Just when I think we're through, you do magic and make me love you. At the drop of a hat, it's as easy as that, with the merest attempt at a sigh. When I'm sure you're untrue, you do magic and make me love you. Guess I'm just, after all, at your beck, at your call. Seems we'll never be for you and me all over. With the twist of the wrist, I get back on your list. Doesn't matter how hard I may try. How can I keep away from your very persuasive voice? When with a twist of the wrist, I'm yours. With a twist of the wrist, with your lips that insist, with that come hither look in your eyes. 
Just when I think we're through, you do magic and make me love you. At the drop of a hat, it's as easy as that. With a merest attempt at a sigh. When I'm sure you're untrue, you do magic and make me love you. Guess I'm just after all. At your back, at your call. Things will never be for you and me all. With a twist of the wrist, I stay back on your lips. Doesn't matter how hard I may try. How can I keep away from your very persuasive all When with a twist of the wrist, with your lips set and twist and a twist of the wrist, I'm yours. That was very nice. Me, 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 me. No encore, no, please. No, 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 oh, oh, that's uh, is that you, Jimmy? Stop making that noise. Noise, Fred. I'm just practicing my scale. Well, you sound, uh, sounded as though you had your lip caught in a door, Jimmy. <laughs> I hope. That's a fine thing to say after all the years I've spent studying voice. So you ought to hear me do this except from Lucia. Alone? Yeah, and the yeah. anvil chorus from Il Trovatore. And the refrain from smoking. Now, wait a minute. Uh-uh, uh-uh. The refrain from smoking. I've never heard of that. <laughs> Haven't? No, I haven't. Oh, it's a beautiful Ooh. thing. Well, I... I'll sing it for you. No, no, you... no, wait a minute. Wait, no, wait. No, me or you either. Neither of you. We don't want you to sing it. Now, just give us the lyrics without the music. Well, okay, friend. Uh, how does it go? Thanks. Oh, wait a minute. Can I have to... Was I supposed to say that? Now, wait. Let's make sure. Yes, I was supposed to say, how does it go? It's right here. Well, <laughs> well, now that we're all even, I'll tell you. Yes, how does it go? Thank you. When you see smoke coming from the exhaust pipe of the car ahead, you're not likely to pull up alongside and say, refrain from smoking. No. It wouldn't do much good if you did. Only a repair job will help that car owner, for his smoking exhaust is a likely sign of excessive engine wear. But if your car doesn't smoke, you can help to make sure it will continue to refrain from smoking. And now is the time to act when you're making your spring oil change. Have a Texaco dealer drain that weakened winter oil from the crankcase and replace it with insulated haviland. Haviland is insulated against today's high engine temperatures that break down ordinary oils. It stands up and protects your engine from needless wear. Haviland is distilled, too, free from carbon-forming impurities that also promote wear. So don't delay. Steer clear of smoke and trouble. Change to insulated Haviland at your Texaco dealer. Star Theater continues after a brief pause for your station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC New York, 880 on your dial. Small helping of Let's Stream This One uh, Out, contributed by our musical somna- uh, somnambulist, uh, Maestro Goodman. And now our Texaco Roundtable, ladies and gentlemen. This is the only discussion group in radio that concentrates on trivia. Now, our three guests have been drafted for their unrehearsed participation, and Portland opens the meeting first by calling the roll. Yes, Mr. Joseph Costa from Rockville Center, Long Island. Well, good evening, Mr. Costa. Good evening, Fred. How are you? Uh, oh, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> well, I would. that would take three or four hours to explain, Mr. Costa, my uh, uh, condition at the moment. But thank you for having uh, brought it up. I was going to ask you, if you have no objections, to tell us what uh, your business or profession is. Do you mind? I'm a press photographer, Fred, employed by the New York Daily News. But I also have another job at the present time. You have two jobs? Yes, I have. Uh, well, how do you account for that? What is your other job? Well, well, I should ask you first, because maybe the other job is more important than the one you're going to explain, and then I'd be in a fine mess here. 
Well, as vice president of the Press Photographers Association of New York... Really? I've been busy staging the biggest show in New York. Oh, wait a minute. Outside of yours, excuse me, outside of yours. Oh, outside of ours. Well, what is this other show you're staging that's uh, not quite as big as ours? Fred? (laughs) Uh, I hope for your sake it's bigger. Fred, this is... Wait a minute. Who is he? That's the... He's one of my students, Fred. Oh, you have your own photographer with you, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I didn't know. Whose picture are you taking, son? Oh, everyone. Well, all right. As long as it's a community affair, go right ahead. Well, where, what did you say, uh, this, uh... Well, Fred, as, uh, as vice president of the Press Photographers Association of New York... Oh, don't go through that again. Going. Where is that? You're collecting <laughs> pictures. Now, where... This is the sixth annual exhibition of the... Where is the exhibition? At the Museum of Science and Industry in Rockefeller Center. Oh, down in the cellar there, huh? That's right, on the first floor. Fred. On the first floor, the Museum of Science. And you know, that's a wonderful building, the Rockefeller uh, Center. But you know, there are people uh, who have been down there since the building opened who are entirely cut off from the outside world down in the basement of the Rockefeller Center building. People haven't been out for six or seven years. These people down there think that when they die, they go to the rainbow room. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Co- uh, Costa. I'm sorry I butted in when you were explaining about your uh, your, your your picture uh, exposition there, but I'll, uh, I'll make it up to you later. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. And now, Portland. Miss Vera. I have to tell you, you know that, that Miss... Uh, <laughs> Miss Vera Adrian from New York City. Uh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Miss, uh, Adrian. I was laughing that I'm something I'm going to say next week, I hope. <laughs> but uh, may I ask, uh, 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 do you work here in New York? Are uh, you in business? Or? Yes, I have my own business, and we try to design for individuals. Oh, you And then do wholesale for an average woman. To what is it you... Wait a minute. What is it you design? Clothes. Oh, you're a clothes designer. Yes. For individuals and for wholesale uh-huh. houses. Yes. You do really. Yes. Do you uh, do you design uh, uh, garments for debutantes and glamour girls? Yes, indeed. That's sort Joseph of. Josephine Johnson wears quite a few of my clothes. Oh, she does really. And these, uh, uh, gla- it must be nice to be in a business where you know you're going to have something on a glamour girl in years to come. <laughs> But uh, tell me, how do you design? I can understand designing a dress for, for one person, but t- how, how would you d- design a dress for, for the wholesale houses, for, for, for mass appeal? Well, well, we have an idea. Every designer has an idea of an average woman. She's about 5'16". Yeah. She's about 135 pounds. Yeah. She's about 5 feet, 5 and a half. But sort of a dirty blonde. Sort of a dirty blonde, <laughs> the average woman. You'll get murdered on the way home. <laughs> Woman is a dirty blonde. How do you like that? <laughs> but you, uh, you, uh, you don't have a composite girl. I mean, you have all her measurements, but you can't uh, 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 tell her taste what the average woman's taste oh, might yes, be. Oh yes, after you work for a few years, I mean, you, you know, you can outguess the average woman. <laughs> yeah. Well, there aren't many people doing it. I mean, if it's any news to you. <laughs> but uh, I, I tell you, do these uh, glamour girls come to your? Uh, aren't you, don't, yes. don't you feel guilty in a business like that? No, indeed not. It's you don't really because you see something. Coming out, it looks so exquisite that you... I mean, after you've designed the dress, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, after all, now, you are dress designer, uh, hairstylist, beauticians, and that. You're all in a great conspiracy. Don't you know, you make a woman look beautiful, and then four or five months later, some poor little guy who never did anything to you in his life is hooked in. <laughs> I mean, just that. No, we never do. Well, you give it some thought, and thank you, Miss thank Adrian. You, and now, Mr. Albert Moore of New York City. Well, good evening, Mr. Moore. May I ask your business? I'm a geodetic computer, Fred. A geodetic computer? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> I have enough trouble with Mr. Costa, who's only a photographer. You know? Don't get me hooked into that. Geodetic, I can't even spell it. Well, that brings us to our question, uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you for helping us save the time. <laughs> Today, we live in an age of speed. We travel fast, we work fast, we eat fast, sleep fast, and do about everything but pay our bills fast. Speed has even influenced our reading habits. We have tabloid newspapers that enable us to see the news at a glance without having to take the time to read it. Outstanding magazine articles, popular novels, and classical literature are condensed and available today in digest form. Now, our question tonight, we're only going to take part of this. Do you think a person who has a limited time for reading benefits more through reading a few books and articles in their original form or reading many things in digest form? Now, Mr. Costa, how do you feel about the digest business? 
My own reaction, Fred, is that the digest form would make a person give him the ability to discuss more things with more people. Yes, but, but he'd only have a little to say about a lot of things. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That makes him look smart. Oh, I mean, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, once over lightly, I mean, to <laughs> call once on all of his friends, he'd be smart, and then right. he'd sort of run out. Well, thank right. you. Do you think, uh, really, do you uh, go over the digest magazines, or would you personally rather read a book or, or an article uh, thoroughly in its original form? Personally, I don't get much time, but I only read a few books thoroughly. But I feel I'm doing the wrong thing sometimes. You feel that you're doing the wrong thing, but you're doing it correctly. Well, that helps a lot. Mr. <laughs> and Miss Adrian, how do you feel about the digest problem? Well, Would you... I, I feel almost the same as any woman that's in business to have such few minutes of time. And when they do have that... They want to enjoy it thoroughly, and I myself would read a book, too. Would read a but book? But I do have to read quite a few um, the, uh, well, small uh, articles about fashion shows and this and that, that I have to do. It's compulsory. Yeah, it's part of your I business, to, and so you Yes, prefer. but when I, for myself and my own enjoyment, I wouldn't read a book. Rather thoroughly. read a book. Well, thank you, Miss uh, Adrienne. And Mr. Moore, how do you feel about it? Well, for light, fluffy stuff, the digest is all right. But if you really want to know a subject... You, you have well to. just can't pass over it. You must study it. Go into it thoroughly. Well, thank you all. I'm sorry we haven't time to go into this more thoroughly. The way our round table stands now, I'm sure that our evasive discussion tonight will have no lasting effect on the digest folk. I think, though, eventually we'll have digest homes, digest meals, digest automobiles, digest jobs, and a digest outlook. And so with everything in digest form, we can truthfully say it's a small world after all. Our round table adjourns, and thank you all. For to bring us to Kenny Baker again in a Gilbert and Sullivan mood now Kenny sings a wandering minstrel eye from the Mikado a wandering minstrel eye a thing of shreds and patches of ballad songs and snatches and dreamy lullaby. My catalog is long through every passion ranging, and to your humors changing, I tune my sort of song. I tune my song. Sentiment is one pen. I take the Arctic ballad cut and dry. For the rare country's banner may be planted. All other local banners are defied. Our warriors in every place assemble. Never quail or they can feel it if they do. And I shouldn't be surprised if nations tremble before the mighty troops that prove the pity And if you call for a song of the sea, we'll hear the captain wrong. With the old reef hope, the wind is free. Her rank to the tip and the helm will leap. Her rock to the homeward bound. To lay aloft in a howling breeze may tickle a landsman's face. But the happiest star of sailor sees it when he's down at an inland town. To it is a Nancy on his knees. He ho Of ballad songs and snatches And dreamy lullaby And dreamy lullaby Just a word from Larry Elliott. Yes, Fred, just one word. Congratulations. 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 Wait a minute. Just Congra a minute. Just a minute, uh, Larry. You sound as though your needle's stuck. 
How many times are you going to say that? Well, I should say it 400,000 times, Fred. Really? Congratulations to the owners of the more than 400,000 1941 cars coming off the assembly line during this, the month of April. Yes, if your name is on one of these beauties scheduled for spring delivery, congratulations. And a reminder, you now have every reason to fly, not just drive the highway with Sky Chief in the tank. For you'll want to enjoy the utmost, all the spirited performance under that gleaming new hood. And Sky Chief, with its flexible power, its great range of smooth response, will make a grand running mate. Then let your car show off its nimbleness in traffic, its hill climbing ability, its smooth gliding motion of the straightaways. Yes, Sky Chief will make your acquaintance with that new car a complete one. It's your Texaco dealer's different premium gasoline for those who want the best. And now the Texaco workshop players. Tonight, they present a Hollywood murder mystery. It's called Death Gets Back on the Job After Taking a Holiday. Or One Long Pan Takes a Chance and Outs Chance Charlie Chan. Music, maestro. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is Ken Crumb, broadcasting from the lobby of Blauman Siamese Theatre here in Hollywood. Tonight, we bring you another gala Hollywood premiere, the first showing of that sensational new mystery, Charlie Chan in Flatbush. This is the... This is the hundredth Charlie Chan picture to be premiered here in Hollywood. Charlie Chan is here. Right now, Charlie's leaving his footprint in the cement here at Blauman Siamese. The lobby's crowded with stars. There goes Slim Somerville. Here's a friend of Gene Autry's passing by. What a night. Every star is out to see Charlie Chan and Flatbush. And here's the producer of the picture, Mr. Sasha Watsell. Tell our radio audience, Mr. Watsell, how much did the picture cost? The picture is costing me $2 million. And can you tell us something about the mystery, Mr. Watsell? How am I going to get back to $2 million? That's the mystery. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha Watsell. And here's the author of the picture, Mr. Ludwig Korn. Uh, good evening, all. You've written the entire Charlie Chan series, Mr. Korn. Yes, but Charlie Chan and Flatbush beats them all. You failed at this. Yes, thing. yes, it topped Charlie Chan and Honolulu, Charlie Chan in Mexico, Charlie Chan in Kankakee, Charlie Chan Get away, Flatbush, get away. Charlie and Chan thank you, Mr. Ludwig Korn. <laughs> and now a word from the director of the picture, the brilliant young genius who has all Hollywood agog, Mr. Dawson Bell. It isn't necessary to introduce me by name. No? Merely say, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. <laughs> the world will know. Hi, Mr. Bell. Tell me, what do you think of your picture? It is magnificent, awe-inspiring, super mediocre. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to call this picture Citizen Chan. The rest, you know. Yes, we do. Thank you, Dawson Bells. And uh, our folks... Here comes the star of the picture, Charlie Chan. Yes, folks, it's Charlie Chan in person. Say something, Charlie. Uh, Charlie Chan, very glad. Say hello. Very glad. Finish 100 picture. Very glad. Oh, oh, oh. Charlie shot. Hey, Confucius, clap hands. Here comes Charlie. Oh, 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 do. He's dead. Get one long pan. Charlie Chan, murdered. Get one long pan. Hello, give me police headquarters. Get one long pan. No, murder. Ah, Gleeting, Gleeting has terrible time stopping car. Almost went by. Greeting and Shola Malakam, Kitty. <laughs> Detective One Long Pan on job. Hello again. O N E Long Pan. Say, who is this? Dennis Day with Jaundice? Not, not, not Dennis Day. I am Detective One Long Pan, Chinese Superman. On Lady every week, Tong Buster, Tong Buster on every week. Who needs a Chinese detective? Who are you, Mister? Talk bad English. I am Sasha Wartel, the producer. You are here to solve Charlie Chan's murder? Not to buy that. Long Pan here to get Charlie Chan job. Long Pan sing, Long Pan talk, Long Pan dance, Long Pan do comedy, all funny stuff. Great, the best for picture, Long Pan Chinese oomph boy. Long Pan make with sweater, make with sweater, sweater boy. <laughs> this is not only a Chinaman, he is crazy. Long, long Pan also sing. There's a brandy known as Hennessy. All night long I'm drinking Hennessy. Please, Hennessy. please, please, I'm begging, solve the murder. Yes, quit calling Long Pan. How about Charlie Chan's murder? Who are you, little man of skimpy hair? <laughs> I am 
I'm Ludwig Korn. I wrote all of Charlie Chan's pictures. Oh, you bad boy. You commit many crime already. <laughs> what the happened, Mr. Horn? Well, Charlie stepped at the microphone to greet his radio pack. What the happened? A shot rang out. Charlie fell. Then what the happened? Charlie gave up the celestial ghost. Then what happened? Uh, Blauman, the manager, locked the audience in the theater. We came into Blauman's office here to wait for the police. So far, so good. And now for $64 question. <laughs> You, you, you catch him, Chan? Yes, yes. What is your question? Where is Charlie Chan's body? Oh, it's lying in state on a pinball machine in the lobby. <laughs> body in lobby? A long time go to lobby, examine body. And thank you, Mr. One long time for lobbying for your body. Oh, some fun, eh, kids? Some fun. Is it okay. true? Tell me, is it true? It's what true? Is Charlie Chan dead? Yes, Charlie Chan is dead. Good. Now I can make a picture of his life. Who are you? I'm Don Amici. Uh, <laughs> Someday, Don Amici go too far. Don Amici play Don Amici. <laughs> Listen, Corn, and you yes. too, Russell. I thought you were getting a detective. This is the detective, Dawson. Who are you, big boy? I am Dawson Bell, the actor, director, author, producer, and all-around genius. What, uh... <laughs> what do you know about, uh, Charlie Chan murder? To whom are you speaking? Bell's the actor, Bell's the director, or Bell's the producer? Long pan grilling bells across the board. <laughs> you, you fetch up. What you know about murder? Nothing. Short and sweet, like Midget's girlfriend. Where's the detective? Where's the detective? Who are you, Missy? I'm the cashier. I've been listening at the keyhole. I've seen the murder. You mean? Ludwig Korn killed Charlie Chan. Why, you in for my little trouble? Oh. You insinuate that I, Ludwig Korn, the author of the Charlie Chan picture. Please. You were standing next to Charlie Chan at the microphone. You had your hand in your coat pocket. When Charlie fell, you walked away. Oh, ho, long time search you, Mr. Wooden Egg Horn. Here, here, take your hand out of my sport coat. Aha. Uh-huh. You'll see what long time finds. What? A le wallowa. Hurry, Oh, that proves nothing. This is Hollywood. Anybody might be carrying a revolver. Why don't you search Dawson Bell? Ridiculous. What would I be doing with a pistol? Long time flisk. Make sure. Two. Jeeper, peeper, a side pocket. Look. What? A le wallowa. A revolver? I told you. Search Wassel. He's probably got a gun, too. Who's got a gun? Long time flisk. Make sure. Look in the Wassel coat pocket. Holy smoke, Le Wallowa! Uh, Le Wallowa? Just a minute, somebody put that gun in my pocket. I have no Le Wallowa. <laughs> Me also. This suit is coming with two pair of pants, but no Le Wallowa. <laughs> Le Le Wallowa, very, very fastly. Well, anyway, that proves I didn't murder Charlie Chan. Well, who done it, Long Pan? Long Pan, she'll find out. How, oh, Longy? Oh, very simple. Kitty, kitty stuff. Kitty stuff for Long Pan. Long Pan examined Le Wallowa? Long time see which Willie Wallowa has bullet missing. Holy smoke! All three Le Wallowa have one bullet missing. They're baffling. What's your next move, Long Pan? Long Pan examine body. Law location bullet hole soft crime. Where is body? Charlie's right outside laying on a pinball machine. Very good. Let's go. Right through here. Oh, you see, Long Pan. Oh, there he is. Poor Charlie. What a beautiful death for an actor. Passing out on a pinball machine. <laughs> Still in right. Oh, you see, Charlie, Charlie looked better than one long pan. Oh, Charlie eat better, too. Fat boy, big belly. Plenty egg for young, I'm fish. Aha! Find something, long pan? Powder burn on court. Left side. Oh, standing left side. Not me, I was on his right side. Yeah, I... you was on Chan's left side, Mr. Corn. And on top of that, I've seen you do it. Oh, this is ridiculous. Aha. Uh-huh. What is object here? Clutch in Charlie Chan's hand. It's a book. Your best book. A little book, too. It's a pocket act. Exactly. Names of cities, countries, check off here, you see. Yeah. Hawaii, Madagascar, South Africa. What do you make of it, Long Pan? Charlie Chan, the detective to end. Left fatal clue personally to help Long Pan solve mystery. Then you know who made it, Charlie. Your bet. The murderer, eh? Well, I've got to get back to the studio. I'm 14 conferences behind. Not so fast, uh, Mr. Corn. Holy Mr. Bell. Here, I'm Mr. Bell. I've got him, Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell. Now, Mr. Nudnik Corn, this atlas belongs to you. You fetch up. You kill Charlie Chan. No, no, I didn't. You, you plant Le Wallowa and don't such smell such a pressure pocket. You fire one bullet from there, Le Wallowa, at home. Fatal bullet, you fire at Charlie Chan personally. Well, all right. I confess. I did it. I had to do it. Why you kill Charlie? Oh, you bad boy. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. In all my pictures, I've had Charlie in every country, city, and hamlet on the face of the earth. 
Charlie Chan and Timbuktu. Charlie Chan and Dong Dang everywhere. I finally had to kill him. I couldn't find another place for Charlie Chan to go. But why you plant the gun on those are smells and such a pretzel? Well, that was a plot I used in Charlie Chan and Walla Walla. What happened? It didn't work in the picture either. Exactly. Long time I left you, Mr. Ludwig Cohen, for murder Charlie Chan. Well, do you think I'll get the hot seat long time? Oh, sure. Certainly, silly Billy. Aesop say, man who writes B picture, sure to get stung in the end. Don't finish your fire every time. <laughs> up for the defense. The next few moments are devoted to the entire petroleum industry by the Texas Company. For over 20 years, the unparalleled forces of industrial America have been geared to peacetime production. They are now engaged in meeting the great emergency and problems of our national defense program. When the hurry call for preparedness came, the petroleum industry was ready, completely ready. The production and supplying of oil is in full stride on all fronts, and our known oil resources are the greatest in our history. Yes, the American petroleum industry is at full strength, is mobilized for all demands of our industrial, military, and naval defense programs, as well as those of civilian life. The petroleum industry is ready for national defense. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for letting the Texaco Star Theater service your radio hour, uh, your radio, rather, for this hour tonight. We'll be back, <laughs> wrong till the end, it is I. We'll be back to render the same service next Wednesday night at Texaco time. This is Fred Allen saying good night for the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast and inviting you to drive in any time. Remember, you're welcome. <laughs>